Welcome to our online service. Thank you for joining us. Uh, the Bible speaks uh, of the Christian life uh, as being a race, uh, a long distance race where we must press on. Uh, over the last few weeks, um, a couple of, of our brethren have finished their race uh, and we believe they are receiving their reward. Uh, we who remain uh, will race on uh, and seek to do the best that we can with the time that the Lord gives to us. Pray that he would speak to us just now. Please uh, let me lead us in prayer for this service. Father, we thank you. Thank you for Rome. We thank you for Ray. Uh, uh, and we pray for their families that remain uh, and sorrow. Pray that you would lift them up. Uh, we ask uh, in the course of this uh, time we have online together, uh, that you would speak to us, open your word to us, uh, and, 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 and change us for the better, that we may run the best race that we can run. Amen. Good morning, everybody, and uh, once again, welcome to this month's Apologetics Talk. This month, we're going to discuss, if Christianity is true, 
Why are there so many denominations? This was a question that was particularly put to me by Muslims that I used to meet on a weekly basis. Why does the Bible have so many apparent interpretations if it's supposed to be true, if God is not the God of confusion? Now, if you look closely enough and and know where to delve, Wikipedia will tell you that there are about 40,000 different denominations. Personally, I find this quite incredulous, and I'll have something to say about this number a bit later on. How can Christianity be true if there are so many disagreements? Now, it's important to answer this question, first of all, by asking ourselves, what exactly is a Christian? Now, according to one website, Religious Tolerance, um, they came up with an answer about a Christian, and I'll quote, those that honestly believe themselves to be following the teachings of Jesus as they interpret those teachings to be. Now, this is an incredibly broad definition, and it leads us to place underneath that umbrella a whole disparate number of groups, Protestants, um, Roman Catholics, Eastern Orthodox, Mormons, Jehovah's, Jehovah's Witnesses, Christian Scientists, New Thought, and the Unification Church. But within this group, there are so many different beliefs. Some believe that Jesus is divine and human. Some believe that he's just human, a created being. Um, Some believe that we need redemption. Others believe that we don't. And the list of contradictory beliefs goes on and on. So where have we got the information to inform us? Well, clearly the Bible has got lots to say about this, but the very early Christians had five fundamental essential beliefs, and I'll list them as follows. First of all, the deity of Jesus. In the New Testament, John's Gospel, chapter 8, verse 58, Jesus said to those listening, Before Abraham was, I am. This was a direct reference to the book of Exodus in the Old Testament, when Moses stood before a burning bush and a voice cried, Say that I am has sent you. I am was the name of Jehovah, the name of God, and here Jesus makes a direct connection. The resurrection of Jesus, absolutely essential. He he rose in bodily form. If Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain, says Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Then we worship only the one God, the Lord our God. The Lord our God, he is one. Deuteronomy 6 verse 4. Salvation is by grace. By grace you have been saved through faith. Paul writes in Ephesians chapter 2 verses 8 and 9. Grace is the unmerited favour of God towards us. It's all of God and nothing to do with us. Christ died for our sins. He is our sin bearer. This too is essential for the Christian faith. So here are the five points in summary, the five essential points that the early Christians believed and makes up uh, the beliefs of Christians. And so we can see at once that there are certain um, groups which would be excluded from this list straight away. The Jehovah's Witnesses are one example. They do not believe that Jesus is divine. They believe he was a created being, that there was no physical resurrection. They don't believe in salvation by grace and grace alone. The Mormons too would have to go. They deny that there is only one God. They deny that there is salvation by grace and grace alone. uh, And that Jesus was an uncreated deity. There would be others, of course, like the Unitarians who deny the Trinity. But we don't have time to discuss that yet. And maybe we'll just leave that for a future apologetic talk. So when these central doctrines are seen, we begin to see that Christianity does not argue within itself about these things, but it argues with other different religions. Christian Christian denominations, rather, um, fundamentally agree, uh, uh, but disagree on some of the non-essentials, such as who should take communion, um, how the worship is organised, how the church is organised, And it's true that sometimes these disagreements have led to the formation of different denominations. But what unites Christians is a fundamental belief in the doctrines listed above. 
that Jesus was and is divine um, and that he physically rose from the dead and that he died for our sins and that we are saved to live with him in heaven by faith in him. Finally, it should be said that um, the vast majority of Christians actually just go to a handful of denominations. And in the past, a denomination has been defined by a minor disagreement with churches that have separated. Um, so that would account for probably most of the denominations listed amongst those 40,000. Every year, I go to a convention in the northwest of the country. Over a th three week period, about 13,000 Christians attend. And above the entrance to one of the doors is the true statement that we are all one in Christ Jesus. Yes, what unites us fundamentally outweighs what has divided us in the past. Hope you've enjoyed listening to it and thank you for listening. Today's reading is about Isaiah 45 verses 20 to 25. The Lord, the only Saviour, assemble yourselves and come, draw near together. You who have escaped from the nations, they have no knowledge, who carry the wood of their carved image and pray to a God that cannot save. Tell and bring forth your case. Yes, let them take counsel together. Who has declared this from ancient time? Who has told it from that time? Have not I the Lord? And there is no other God besides me, a just God and a Saviour. There is none besides me. Look to me and be saved, all you ends of the earth. For I am God and there is no other. I have sworn by myself, the word has gone out of my mouth in righteousness and shall not return that to me every knee shall bow, every tongue shall take an oath. He shall say, Surely in the Lord I have righteousness and strength. To him men shall come, and all shall be ashamed, who are incensed against him. In the Lord all the descendants of Israel shall be justified and shall glory. Amen. Your glorious cause, O oh God, engages our hearts. May Jesus Christ be known wherever we are. We ask not for ourselves, but for your renown. The cross has saved us so we Oh
Well, hello and welcome to our 156th Sunday online meeting for the 19th of February 2023. Modesty is the subject. I am going to speak about it, I hope, modestly. Uh, modesty in people, modesty in God, and then some lessons in modesty uh, for us, those three points. By way of a definition, maybe part of a definition, I, this is the bit I'm going to emphasise. It's not making myself, you know, my skills, my abilities, my looks, my achievements, whatever, known unnecessarily. That's a key uh, word here. Modesty in people. Um, I mean, I think modesty would be admired if it was noticed. But how do you notice modesty? <laughs> um, hello, I am very modest. Look at me. Not really modest. So it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a bit of a tricky one. Proverbs chapter 20, verse 6 is interesting, almost to me, amusing, sadly true. Most men will proclaim everyone his own goodness but a faithful man who can find he's, he wants it known how good he is now it's not that he's necessarily proclaiming uh lying about his goodness maybe he's he gives to charity he's kind or something but he wants it to be known in some way i think in our culture we would need it to be a little you know we'd have to slip it in somehow but, but, you know, just to make it known. Um, but it contrasts with a faithful man because once my basic motivation for doing something good is to be seen to be doing that goodness, the temptation will be very, very quickly, whether I've done it or not, just to give that impression. I'm, I'm living off my ego, my, 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 the image that I'm trying to create. Jesus said some very interesting things. Again, we can't help but smile at this. Um, but I don't think they would have been smiling at the time because Jesus was reflecting the situation at the time. And Jesus often challenged the culture of the time. And he does the same today. It, his, his teaching often challenges our culture. He says, take heed that you do not your arms, your righteousnesses. And this is particularly referring to giving charitable giving, kind giving, before men, so that people notice, to be seen by them. Otherwise you have no reward of your Father which is in heaven, something that genuinely benefits a person or a group of people. You get no benefit from as far as God is concerned. He's looking at why you did it. Therefore, Jesus says, on this basis, when you do your arms, when you do it, you're bound to do it. Obviously, you should be being kind to people. That's just assumed by the Lord Jesus. Do not sound a trumpet before you, <laughs> as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may have glory of men. Here I am doing some magnificent thing, like the people who ostentatiously, on another occasion, were throwing money into the temple collecting box, demonstrating how kind or rather generous they were. Jesus said, verily, truly, I say to you, they have their reward. I used to think that was something sinister. It just means they get their respect and kudos from people. They don't get it from God. They've got their reward. That's all you get. If it works, of course. But when you do your arms, don't let your left hand know what your right hand does. <laughs> A metaphor, obviously. That your arms, your kindnesses may be in secret, that your father which sees in secret shall reward you openly. Such a thing now, literally sounding a trumpet, literally doing it. We use the phrase, oh, don't sound your trumpet and so on. But um, literally done. Well, it wouldn't have seen odd, odd at the time. In fact, the teaching of Jesus criticising it would have seen odd, seemed odd. And here is a, an important lesson. Truth always trumps culture. Always. Lovely, your culture, my culture, lovely. But in comparison to the truth of God, no. This is the truth. Make your culture, centre it round 
the truth. And I think in our Western culture, molded by this kind of teaching as it was, I think we're beginning to move away from it, getting into self-promotion. Yes, write a CV. They want to know what you can do. Yes, write it realistically, properly, but don't exaggerate. Don't sound, blow your own trumpet in that respect. Okay, modesty in people, modesty in God. After all, if modesty is a virtue, God should exemplify that virtue. If we're made in his image and it's good for us to be modest, well, God must be modest. We're in his image. Yes, that image has been marred, but in Christ it can be remolded, and so therefore we should see it also in Christ. Well, let's take it. Some verses um, where God is speaking through Isaiah about himself. He's talking about himself. Is that modest? Depends. If it's something we need to hear and not to say it would damage us, of course it's not immodest to say it. <laughs> That's logical. Um, this was our reading, and I'm going to read you verses 20 and 21 of Isaiah chapter 45, without saying a lot about the context because of time. Verses 20 and 21. <clears throat> God is here saying, I've got no competition. Ooh. Assemble yourselves, come, draw near together, you that are escaped of the nations. They have no knowledge that set up wood of their graven image and pray to a God that cannot save. Tell ye and bring them near. Yes, tell them to take counsel to, together, the people and their gods. What, get what advice you can from them. A lot of good it will do you. Who has declared this from ancient time? Who's told you from that time? Have not I, Jehovah? I've told you. I'm the only God. These, these, these idols are useless. Anything you put in place of me is an idol, and it's useless. Both its counsel, the advice it gives, the philosophy of life it gives, and obviously its power. There is no God else beside me, a just God and a saviour. There's none beside me. <laughs> Sounds like megalomania. It's just simply truth. Like Cassius Clay, and you know, I am the greatest. I remember when Muhammad Ali was called Cassius Clay. Well, whether he was or wasn't, he was hardly being modest. Well, is God just doing the same? No, we need to hear this. Verse 22, look to me and be saved all the ends of the earth. I am God, there's none else. There's the reason I can meet you, save you, help you, rescue you. No one else can do it. It's no good me being modest and saying, oh, well, maybe I can't, maybe others can help. When they can't, that's lying, that doesn't help. That's not being modest, that is being hateful. Verse 23, listen to this. I have sworn by myself, the word is gone out of my mouth in righteousness. This is right, it's correct, it's true, and shall not return, and I'm never going to go back on this, that unto me every knee shall bow, every tongue shall com uh, confess. There's going to come a time when every living person on earth will submit to me and acknowledge that I am the supreme king, lord of everything. And, and now, and I'm telling you that, you need to know that. Verse 24, surely shall one say, in the Lord have I righteousness and strength. Even to him shall men come, and all that are incensed against him shall be ashamed. You're angry against the Lord. You're wasting your time. Your righteousness, your strength is in him. Anyone who comes to him can find that to be true. We need to know that, obviously. And, and the last one, verse 25, the last verse I'm going to mention. In the Lord, in Jehovah, in Yahweh, the God of the Old Testament, shall all the seed of Israel be justified and shall glory. Have they got anything to boast about? It's in him, not themselves. Uh, they're, they're just, we're vindicated, not because we're good people or for any reason other than he, his choice, his goodness. We're his people. That's a wonderful thing. Now, that's Jehovah, and he needed to say that, so there's nothing immodest about it. Was Jesus different, old, meek and mild? 
Yes, he was meek and he was mild. That is absolutely correct. But he was God in the flesh, actually God who became a man. So he's not going to be different in character, <laughs> obviously. He said he was the Messiah, the promised one, the one that all the Old Testament people looked to. Now, he often wanted to play down both the miraculous things he did and any uh, understanding that people had that he was the Messiah because for a practical reason he might then find it difficult to minister with all the crowds around him attracted by the fact of uh, the claim of his Messiahship. It was pretty obvious anyway by his uh, miracles and people should rightly have deduced that he was the Messiah. So there was a practical reason but and and, and, and unnecessarily saying I'm the Messiah it, it would be foolish and wrong but when he entered Jerusalem just at the last at the end of his last week of his life on a donkey in fulfillment of Zechariah's prophecy he was saying to everybody I am the Messiah they needed to know he knew it would then cause him to be crucified but that was the whole point he would be crucified for our sins and would rise from the dead so that the nature of his messiahship would then be understood, which it wasn't when he entered Jerusalem. That's another thing. But, but it's not immodest of him to say, I'm the messiah. He said, I'm God. Not all the time. And he was more or less forced into it. If you look at John chapter 8, verse 58, where he said, before Abraham was, I am, which was a, a, a claim to be Jehovah, Yahweh uh, of the Old Testament. And the people knew it. They, they, This is blasphemy. They were so mad. They wanted to stone him and kill him. They weren't allowed to kill people. They had to apply to the Romans, which they did in the end to see him, to, 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 to get him killed. But they were so mad that they were, were going to do it there and then. Because he said, but he was God. He said, I am the way, the truth and the life. I'm the life. I'm the truth. And the only way to the father, the only way you'll discover God to be your father, not a father just, but your father, is through me. Megalomania. Simple truth. And you need to know it. It's not immodest of him to say it. Um, if you look, at, I'm not going to refer to it now, or I'm only going to refer to it without reading verses, but if you look at Matthew chapter 25, verses 31 to 46, Jesus there claims that he will be the judge of every single person individually. That he, as a man, will sit on the judgment and everybody will be sorted into in the, the, the sheep or goats. That's the picture. And he will sift every single person. He was only on earth. He only knew a few people on earth. Really. But he's going to do that knowledgeably. And that the basis of that judgment is how people treated him. Every single person on earth, whether it was before he was born or after he had died, as far as this world is concerned, would be treated on the basis of how they treated him. Now, you'll have to see how that works by reading the parable. What a claim. No other person, surely in history, has ever even made claims that outlandish and ridiculous. And, uh, as I say, like the megalomaniacal. Is that a word? It'll do. And, but they were, they were just simply true. And you need to know that. That's why I'm telling you. Paul said this of Jesus. Philippians chapter 2, having said he, he, he'd become man, humbled himself, uh, died on a cross, was raised from the dead. But let me read you, Philippians chapter 2, what Paul said about Jesus. Wherefore God also has highly exalted him, given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, it means saviour, Jehovah's salvation, every knee should bow. You can do it now. Bow to you are saviour, my saviour. Of things in heaven, things in earth, things under the earth. And that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. In other words, that what Jehovah announced about himself in Isaiah 45 is true of Jesus. Now you may say, 
and it's going to happen. Yes, I can do it in my heart now, but it's going to happen anyway. That one could say, well, that's just Paul sounding off. But according to Jesus in, in, in John's Gospel, chapter 15, it was actually the Lord Jesus teaching, continuing his teaching through the Holy Spirit, inspiring Paul and the other apostles. Because it's essential that you know this about me, Jesus is saying, so that you can rightly relate to me and be blessed and saved. A couple of lessons from this to conclusion. Don't blow your own trumpet. Blow the Lord's trumpet. <laughs> um, here's a, just a word for Christians. Though, if you're not a Christian, it might be interest of you uh, to note this. Paul says in Romans chapter 12 from verse 3, he says, For I say through the grace given to me, to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think. Don't get exalted ideas about yourself which would lead you to be immodest. But to think soberly, soundly, carefully, sensibly, according as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. Deals with us in the same way, in some ways, on grace and kindness and, and, and salvation and so on. But he, we, we have different roles to play. For as we have many members in one body, the church is likened to a body, all the members have not the same office. You know, 1 Corinthians uh, 12 speaks, you know, the difference between a hand and an eye and an ear and so on. You need them all. For we being many are one body in Christ, and every one members one of another, having then gifts differing. It's all the gift of God. According to the grace that is given to us, whether prophecy, let us prophesy. You've got a gift of ministry. You can, you can speak, you can teach, you can do whatever it is that you're given to do in the church. Do it. Don't try and... Well, if I was to say, oh, no, I couldn't possibly. I'm not good. I, I, I'm, I'm, I can't tell you that... that, that minister to you I can't teach from the Bible well what are you doing it for if you can't do it you just get on with what you can do well maybe this isn't your gift you've got a different gift get on with it it's not immodest to pretend maybe you've got you're able you've got a skill maybe you have a particular skill that you can give to the Lord or you, you're a particularly people's person how valuable that is if it's given to the Lord and so on um don't, but, but, but not blowing your own trumpet. Do it for Jesus. Now, I, I met somebody um, uh, just recently, uh, a neighbour of mine, who has got families, in, if family members in Turkey, some of them he hasn't heard from, the earthquake, he's worried about it. Now, I said, shall I pray? And I prayed with him on the street. We prayed for them and indeed for him. Isn't that big-headed? I think I can intrude in your culture and something that's happening miles and miles away, I can have anything to do with? No, I'm praying to God in the name of Jesus. He can help. So if you like, as Jesus said, you are the light of the world to his disciples, but he also said, I'm the light of the world. Well, he is the light of the world in us. And I'm pointing to him and there's no person on earth I cannot help by praying for them and if they understand my language I understand this I can point them to Jesus now it's not immodest to say that that's absolutely right but let me not add to that and think it's because I'm rather special or rather good it's not it's because I've admitted I am a sinner I, I, I cannot do anything of any value in and of myself and I've given myself to him. He forgave me. He changed me. He redeemed me. He received me to himself. And now, in his name, I can help you. Final thing. Do you tend to be immodest? There's an inclination to, even if you try not to be. And this is even if you're introvert. It's not a question of extroverts are immodest and introverts are modest. No, 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 no. That's just how you happen to be. Um, even an introvert in their little circle, 
might want to give a good impression. That's immodest. Well, if you're like that, and it's the basic default position of people, then you need a saviour. You need this Lord Jesus who says, look to me and be saved all the ends of the earth. You need to be saved not only from every kind of sin, but this one in particular. Let me just quote to you the words of the Lord Jesus found in Matthew 11 at the end. Come to me, all ye that labour and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Whoever you are in the whole world, come to me and I can give you rest. Not immodest. It's true. Then he says, take my yoke upon you, learn of me. I'm meek and lowly of heart. You shall find rest to your souls. Here's the picture. Um, I like this ox pulling a pulling a plough. You can join me. Be yoked with me. We can do this together. And if you learn from me my kind of modesty, real modesty, that doesn't pretend I can't do things for people, but doesn't make, isn't boasting beyond the situation and what the situation demands. Learn that kind of modesty and learn it with me, from me. And the reason you'll learn it is because I am like that, meek and lowly in heart. I am modest. I'm not afraid to be associated with someone like you. You're only here because I've invited you and because I've changed you, but I want you here. I love you and now I'll teach you to be like me. And in the end, I will totally change you so that you will be like me and you'll find rest. You'll find peace in that way. Tend to be immodest. Let the Lord Jesus save you from that and then work with him. It's a lifetime work to get rid of that immodesty and then I shall shine in his image. I will be as perfect morally as the Lord Jesus and I won't be boasting one little bit because I can say it's all from him. My confidence now is in him. Put your confidence now in him, your trust in him. He will save you and he will do it now. Thank you.
Let's pray together. We thank you, our Lord Jesus. You are God and all that that means. And yet you are our saviour. You became man to die and you invite us now alive forevermore to yourself. Help us to learn from you. Be changed by you. The blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit. Bless us all to that end. Amen. Amen.